Hello. I have been asked to talk a little bit about, or for five minutes, about the impact of the white system on research enterprise. For example, the types of questions asked or methods used. In order to do that, I would like to just give a little bit of history of science. And uh, I am going to do that not right now. I'm gonna share my screen and just give you uh, a little bit of, a little history of science. Uh, so here we're talking about settler colonialism, which actually arose around the same time that Western science arose. And the colonial matrix of power had four main um, uh, actions or things that it used in order to control uh, the environment. The first was the control of the economy through indigenous land appropriation, through African labor exploitation, and the control of resources. Uh, then there was a control of authority, like the government, normative social institutions, the military, and things like that. Control of gender and sexuality, you know, definitely before the 1920s, and actually still now, we're finding sexism and misogyny, and those things were taught through family structures and education. And the one that really impacts science the greatest is really the control of subjectivity and knowledge and uh, various uh, or Western epistemologies and the whole idea that um, subjectivity was universal. Uh, you know, some of the assumptions of the Western epistemy are that Western values and culture are universal and the pinnacle of social evolution. So everyone else around the world needs to look like what the West looks like. That science is neutral. Personally, I think science is neutral. Scientists are not neutral, but science is neutral. And that subjectivity is un universal and transparent. You know, thinking that the Western mind could uh, absolutely determine what other people were thinking or what they should be thinking if they weren't so primitive or uncivilized. And that uh, anyone who resisted, resisted uh, uh, you know, being consumed by Western epistemologies or ways of knowing or, or within Western culture that you, we were just too ignorant to know, uh, you know, that was really what was the best for us. And that uh, learning is unilinear. It comes from the West to the rest rather than multidirectional. And all of these are one of the reasons why Western scientists are having issues. Uh, this is what happened, you know, this is one very, very small example of the role that science played in uh, uh, settler colonialism and for many of us in cultural genocide. Um, and then finally, uh, here's another example just of how uh, Western science uh, back in the beginning of settler colonialism and to this day to a certain extent uh, really takes as its function to uh, normalize a Western hegemony over the way uh, we should think and the way that we should live. So I just want to make sure that I say that it's not science that is new, uh, is um, the problem. Science isn't uh, bad or, um, you know, um, unobjective, it's scientists that the ones that uh, are uh, creating some of the problems with, you know, the questions that they ask and the assumptions they have of the science that they perform. And, um, you know, a lot of indigenous people and other BIPOC people mistrust Western science because of present day disparities, the long history of social and scientific abuse, because of less access to medical care, uh, genocidal policies of the, of the US government and um, that's one of the reasons that mistrust of Western science among many BIPOC people is the norm. But again, I want to say that, you know, it's not Western science, it's Western scientists. Uh, there's a lot of indigenous scientists like me and like all of my a cohort of uh, BIPOC scientists that I think are doing excellent science. I'll give you one uh, a good example of that. I remember I was sitting on a National Institutes of Health actually National Institutes of Mental Health study section. I sat on it and reviewed grants for like four years. I think that's the term of a study section involvement. And uh, I saw this one and this was back in the um, 200s, maybe, you know, 10, 12 years ago, or actually even longer ago. 
And I remember reviewing this incredible application to look at what was the role of uh, education, uh, and it was among African Americans in the US. And what was really fueling the idea that African Americans should not do good in school, that they should not do good in grammar school and they should not stand out in high school. And actually the, uh, the um, principal investigator was posing ideas like, you know, people who, African Americans who do well in high school are thought of to be, uh, you know, um, just, abiding by the master's rules or somehow trying to be white and losing their uh, black community identity. And uh, everyone besides me, I mean, I gave it an A plus in the review process. I thought, wow, this is excellent research. And, you know, everyone else in the study section said, what are you talking about? There's no valid, you know, there's no valid research that shows that, you know, the presumptions of this research is even true. This very week in Hidden Brain, uh, Shankar Vedantam actually did an excellent uh, talk uh, about that in, in very same topic about how so much, uh, so much uh, in some African American communities to do well in school means that you're abiding by the master's rules. And this is how many years later, 15 years later, this is still a huge issue and would have been, it been wonderful if the African American person who submitted that research 15 years ago could have gotten funded to do that then, you know, how much farther would be along on changing the norms of what um, education looks like to BIPOC people in order for us to invest, invest in it much more authentically well, strength and let instead of, uh, you know, an assimilationist strength. Anyway, that's what I think sometimes happens when our Western science is too white supremacy oriented. Thank you.